Thank you for having me here today. Um, I, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about um, about the kind of the formation of the practice, and then lead on to lead on to some of the kind of current work which we're working on. But I thought it might be quite interesting because it was not that long ago. It was only about ten, maybe twelve years ago that we that well, it was ten years ago that we formed, or it's nine years ago. But 12 years ago, we were, it was the kind of foundations of the practice, and when we were similar age to um, to some of you guys. So uh, this is Ed and myself in our first studio, and we we first started working together in second year, doing um, collaborations on on a range of kind of competitions, so student competitions, um, and we were kind of we had very different design kind of skills and styles at that stage, and over time we've kind of converged, but. We found initially that there was just a really good, a really good kind of rapport between the two of us. One of us kind of Ed is a meticulous kind of person in terms of detail, and I was kind of had a bit more kind of uh, passion for um, buildings in landscape and and the kind of externals. So, this was a, a, a diagram we produced ages ago, but it, it was I thought it was really interesting because. Um, when, when starting a practice, um, there were quite a few friends who started practices out of part two, and they kind of formalized and they set up before they had any work, and some of them, some of them kind of survived and some of them didn't. But what I, the point I was going to make was that there was a huge long lead time for us setting up our practice, because in our, out of part one, we were, given the, well, we were given the opportunity to design the first project. So that was way back in 2005. And that project wasn't delivered until 2009. And so we had a kind of a really soft start. But then it meant that when we did get going, we had a project that was published. It meant that we could kind of, we could attract staff. And it meant that it kind of, you know, we, there, was a, there was a bit of momentum. I just thought some of these things are interesting. You know, we, we set up the practice, but then we uh, started doing kind of part two in around uh, 2009. So despite having kind of PI insurance from back in 2005, we were not kind of, we were not qualified or chartered for the next four years. Um, we started as an LLP. We later flipped to being a, a limited company. These are our websites, and these are the kind of the length of the period that staff were with us. And we couldn't really retain staff for more than about two years because their ambition was kind of growing faster than the, than the duration of projects. So I thought that was, that was quite interesting. So this is our first ever project, which was called T-Pren, and it's a, it's a Welsh, um, it's a house in Wales in Brecon, or uh, just outside Brecon, overlooking, that's Penny Fan in the background. Um, and it uses larch, which was milled on the, on the other side of the valley, um, and lots of recycled slates. Um, we didn't realize quite how, kind of, how pivotal this project would be for us in terms of, kind of setting, setting the agenda. So um, it's a bit like when you look at somebody's website. You know, we, all have a, we all have a first impression, or you have the first impression from when you meet somebody. And this project meant that we, were, we started winning lots more rural projects. We, we were winning projects where clients wanted to use materials in a certain way. Um, and, and it just it kind of started to kind of establish our, our values around certain environmental principles. Um, for example, this, this, it was really nice. There's no, there's no boiler in this house. So there is, well, there's a, uh, there's a log burning stove with a back boiler, and then it's got, photo, uh, it's got solar collectors on the other side, and it all goes into an accumulator tank. And now I think, God, that's, I, I would really struggle to persuade a client to do that now. But, but at that stage, you know, we were kind of straight out of university and, and trying all sorts of things. Um, we employed somebody else actually before we were full time, and that was really important as well because we we didn't quite know uh, how much how, how whether the, whether it was going whether the practice would survive. So we employed Alex Thomas. He was a friend from university. He was full time. We met up in kind of pubs uh, in the evening to review things, um, and we had a studio in East London. And and these were some of the early projects that we were either kind of directly involved with, involved with, or there were there were some of them we were kind of uh, we were volunteering on. But we were constantly, you know, you're constantly trying to kind of pretend that you're more kind of grown up and established than you actually are. So so we were presenting student projects and being a bit ambiguous about them, um, and uh, and trying to kind of win more work. But. But a really key thing for us was that we always wanted to do social projects. So we didn't want to just be doing private houses. So we were desperately trying to get out of that. But um, you know, when you just have a, a one private house in your portfolio, you have to kind of argue all sorts of other, other, other things. Sorry, I just I loved that because 
there was no stuff, <laughs> you know, and now the office is like bursting. You can't move for models and people and files and, and like we just had a really nice sound system. <laughs> so uh, if I was a client and I went into an office like that, I would just say, well, what's your profession? <laughs> you're, not, you're not architects. Um, oh yeah, we had a model maker as like our third employee. So Ed and I were not really earning anything, yet still we had a model maker, which was um, it kind of again it was this kind of student mentality. Um, but we did have a, we did have an office manager really early on, so we didn't get bogged down in in just the kind of admin, which was great. So. Just quickly, these are the buildings that were finished in different years, and you'll just see how the kind of how how a practice kind of forms, and in terms of kind of how it diversifies, um, and and yeah, how each one leads to to very different projects. So that was back in 2009. T. Pren was finished. Um, 2010 was a really kind of you know it was a 20 grand garage and studio, really basic. 2011, kind of small domestic stuff. At this stage, this was a traveling exhibition, and we were the contractor as well, and we made more money on that than pretty much the rest of the jobs combined for the whole year, because when we were told we were going to be the contractor, I was so terrified um, that I, I just kind of completely over all the budgets, and then it actually came in as we had kind of initially thought. So, so that, was, that was quite a good one. Um, so the studio was kind of filling up by this point. It was bloody freezing so we had tried to kind of we used some sheep's wool insulation we ended up putting a raised floor in because some of the some of the some of the stuff were getting chillblains and that wasn't quite so much fun um, but we've got some really fantastic early press so um, the story behind this one was really interesting in that um, there was a there was a, a woman from um, from uh, assemble who came to us for um, an interview and and she, she I, I, won't, I won't say who it was, but she was, she slightly kind of wound me up in the interview. So I gave her this, this ridiculously tough interview where I really kind of wanted to find out what the hell made her tick. And um, instead of her going away and slagging us off to everyone, she mentioned to Rowan Moore, who's a journalist um, at, at The Observer, that we were a really interesting practice. And so he came to interview us, and then there was this article. And, and that kind of served us for about two or three years with kind of various kind of small scale um, uh, commissions. But I just, I just, I've been forever in awe of her attitude ever since. So, um, and I'm sure I, I got it wrong. Uh, so we moved to a slightly larger studio three years later. Um, and, and, and by this point, you know, it's, again, it's all about kind of growing up, being a little bit more presentable, not having that kind of 100 meter long corridor full of bikes and artists kind of junk. So here, here we're in another kind of old, well, it's another old factory. Um, and, and it felt, uh, you know, it was a lot warmer, a lot safer. Um, and during this period of the practice, we were, we were beginning to deliver some other projects. So uh, I'd gone back to my old school, which was Ralph Allen School in Bath, and I'd talked to them about doing a master plan. Um, but in fact, I didn't talk to them about doing a master plan. I went to talk to them about access work and people getting students who wouldn't go into architecture into architecture. And they started talking to me about, well, what, what the hell do we do with our site? So we did this £6,000 master plan and started delivering small elements of it, like um, this outdoor classroom. Um, and, and, and that was the first kind of major break to get away from domestic, domestic work. Um, lots of rural projects, lots of projects in timber. Every project we were kind of trying to treat as a bit of a prototype. So this one is a combination of masonry, cob um, and timber. So it was, it was a very old barn down in Bude. Um, and we got to learn all about, uh, all about uh, cob and how you, how you made it. And this was kind of made from cob blocks with a flick coat on top, how you ventilated it. You know, just loads of, loads of discussions because, again, the, the whole attitude kind of, because we'd kind of set up probably far too early and irresponsibly, but the good thing was that in terms of the culture, that was, that was absolutely massive for us. Um, so uh, first, first proper, proper building, as it were, so um, an applied learning center in Bath, and that, got, um, that, that won some awards, so that, that again really, really helped. And, but then we were kind of finding that we were using these projects, trying to kind of diversify. And we wanted to get, so we wanted to, we love doing education projects, we loved doing um, anything social, as I mentioned. 
But, um, but then we found, we got asked by some graphic designers we knew to work on some exhibition designs. So the, this was, um, these are two projects uh, in New York at the Jewish Museum, and they were, um, they were, they were obviously kind of um, temporary art exhibitions. Um, one of them is called Other Primary Structures, and the other, and, and this one was a collection from a woman called Helena Rubenstein. But we were using those. We used, we, we used the fact that we had worked uh, on some, we were saying we'd worked on some arts projects, which we kind of had, but uh, it was really kind of installation work <coughs> and um, uh, interpretation to, to get the, the, the refurbishment of, uh, of an element of the Hepworth in um, Wake, Wakefield. So, so constantly, you know, the way that I, I, I approach new projects is that if somebody comes to us and they say, right, we want you to work on this or we want you to tender this project, but we don't think you've got the experience, I'll always kind of draw kind of a, a, an imaginary Venn diagram of the sectors we work in and trying to place their project at the heart of it and trying to find where the overlaps are. And you're just trying to kind of reassure them and get, get people on board so that, so that they trust you to, to appoint you to that next step. Um, so uh, more school buildings. This one, this one here with the red stair, uh, it was another project at Ralph Allen School. That I'm, I, that's one of my favourite projects because it's so lean. It was built to, um, it's about 1,400 pounds a square metre. Um, it was built to Michael Gove's building schools for well, uh, his baseline standards for schools um, guidance, which, which basically tried to strip out anything architectural. And we managed to kind of flip that around by, um, there wasn't, it was, the, the funding didn't specify very clearly about gross internal and external area. So we put the circulation externally and we hung the stair, which meant that the footprint was reduced. So the amount of concrete in the, in the footings was reduced. Um, and there were just lots of little tweaks, which meant that, which meant that we could, it was a super lean building and it still had quite a strong identity. Uh, so 2015, some various kind of workplace projects. Um, uh, and then that led, to, that led to our studio moving to Waterloo in 2016. Um, but I'll, I'll come to that in more detail. Um, but that was, that was finished in 2016. Um, the reason we could build our own studio was thanks to this job, which is for a guy called Charlie Bigham. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a food production facility in Wells. And it's in a quarry. Um, and winning that project meant that the... It basically, we could finally afford to build the studio. So we, we'd had planning permission for the studio for two years. We'd been desperate to do it, but we just simply didn't have any money. So whereas that one project, which was so suddenly, you know, the scale of it was miles, miles bigger. You know, it's a 20 million pound project. Uh, the building itself is probably about half of that. But it just the, the, the fees meant that we could do something interesting. Uh, and then 2018, um, these projects were finished. Um, so I'll, I'll rattle through this, but we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how, what kind of, what kind of practice we want to be, and um, and and this is part. These are a couple of extracts from our from our kind of uh, practice plan, um, and these are the sectors we want to be working in. Um, all of our work is for end users. Um, we've got quite a kind of strict kind of PR kind of and activities kind of schedule. So. This is, there's various kind of awards that we wanted to target so that we kind of had the status to be able to go for certain jobs. Um, we have a, quite a lot of studio events. Um, we have somebody who, who helps us with press one and a half days a, a week. Um, I mean, not a week, sorry, a month. Um, and then, and then we've, we're constantly planning about what happens next. So this is thinking about, uh, we're, we're, we're looking to potentially open, uh, open a studio down here. We're, this was last year's slide, so we're already kind of slightly behind there. Um, and then, you know, we're just kind of constantly monitoring things, partly because in the first few years we were so, we had, we had so little money in the practice that the, the impact on kind of personal lives and the impact on the practice, not being able to do any research, not being able to take on certain projects was so kind of, uh, humbling or kind of you know worse than that felt a bit kind of humiliating you know so so we've so we've been working really hard to kind of get up to speed and really understand understand the figures and the turnover and if we make some profit what we can what we can do with that which is going to kind of make us more creative um, and then the work is all over the place uh, and and just to briefly comment on this so 
I'm from the Southwest and we started doing quite a few projects around the Southwest as a result of that. The practice is in London and finally we have quite a lot of London work now. And then really strangely, we've got quite a lot of work in the north of England. And we're finding there that the, the clients know, know one another or it's, it's not kind of six degrees, it's two degrees. So even when, when they're 100 miles apart, if you're working for the National Trust in North Yorkshire in a site which is very, you know, a very kind of busy site, so we're doing a job at Fountains Abbey, then you find that somebody who's down in York knows the general manager and they can kind of quickly kind of cross over with that. We do quite a lot of studio trips, um, which is really important. And then we, we, have, we have an amazing space where we can use, where we can have lots of design reviews. And, um, uh, and these are just some of the trips. So I think it's useful just to have some context. So I'm sorry to have to kind of, you know, drag you through that. But that's, that's a potted history of the practice. But um, I'm going to, I've got three case study stories uh, to talk to you about. Um, and the first of which um, is our studio in, uh, in Waterloo. Um, so you probably will recognize the context, but this is, this is going into Waterloo Station, which has 99 million visitors a year or single, single visits. So it's the, most, it's the busiest station in the country. Uh, you've got Parliament just over there. And then you've got this really kind of funny, skinny little strip of land here, which is owned by St. Thomas's Hospital, which is the, the building back there. And in 2014, uh, my brother, who runs a charity, a local charity, was speaking with one of the local schools, and they had said to him, we want to build a city farm, and we want somebody to come in with us on it. And so, so he said, OK, great, you know, we're, we're, we're quite keen to do that. Um, I might bring my brother along to look at the site. So I, I went along and I said, um, well, why don't we give you a bit of a, a, an outline kind of master plan? You know, like, there's no, there's no money in any of this, you know, it was just, it was clear that they needed a bit of a vision to help them attract funding. So we put together a few slides um, to present back to, to various people to say, this is what we think you could do with it. Um, this is just some of the statistics. It's, despite it being in central London, it's a really poor area. Um, Lambeth kind of comes from uh, lamb and hythe, and it's a bit like um, kind of lamb landing place. So all of the, we've got lower marsh near here and upper marsh, and it was all marshland and farmland a long time ago. And, uh, and our site has had various kind of iterations of uh, Victorian housing that was bombed, then it was, uh, there was some post-war housing, then it was derelict for 30 years. And when, when we came along to it, so St. Thomas's Hospital said, you can have a five-year lease for free if you smarten it up and you do something you do something interesting with it. But when we came along, there was a big fence around it, and in among all of this undergrowth, there was uh, lots of kind of nasty stuff like used needles <coughs> and um, nappies and industrial waste. And and so so the first thing we did is we kind of we did a quick appraisal on which trees should be kept and it's funny like that tree there is a beautiful apple tree and it's the first time I've noticed that that's even that that tree because it was so overgrown with ivy um, so we kept a few of the trees and we did a really simple master plan and the master plan was again trying to kind of understand the essence of each organization so um, so we had Oasis who ran schools and uh, food banks and churches and all sorts of things in the local area and we had Jamie's farm and but we were saying well what is it about, say, a walled garden that could, or a, a farm that could represent the same kind of elements that Jamie's farm was trying to do with, uh, with, with kids from inner cities who were kind of, who are on the margins of exclusion? So, so we were saying, well, this could be a, it could be a retreat from the city. There could be, we could have lots of communal events. It could be a lot, there could be a lot about the culture around eating together, growing food, you know, making things really hands-on. Um, and, and quite kind of utilitarian and simple. And we had to produce a, um, an area schedule for, for animals, because um, the metric handbook didn't, didn't provide this. So, um, so that, was, that was quite interesting. But also then trying to understand the overlapping program. What, what do these animals actually need? Like, how long is it OK to keep them in central London? So they, they, they kind of come on city breaks to central London, and then they go back again. So they come for a few months, and then they go away. 
Um, one of the funniest things we had recently, actually, was that some of the pigs were bought by some of the vegan volunteers who were on the farm, so they rescued them. <laughs> I think my brother was a bit hacked off about it. He was like, that's not the purpose. <laughs> um, but uh, so, yeah, so they got rescued. <laughs> um, so th this is the site. So in, in, in the middle, we've got kind of the hard-working bits of the farm. Then we've got the animal shelters, which was the first phase. The studio, which came next, um, which was never going to be a studio originally. It was just going to be a, um, a kind of a space for an outdoor classroom or, or something for the farm. Um, so the animal shelters are really, really simple. You know, it's kind of, we were drawing from that kind of bush carpentry, you know, kind of very crude um, lapping of joints and uh, post and beam structures. Um, but but the, the important thing was that they, they kind of sat lightly on the site and they could all be unbolted and moved in the future. Um, so we've got all the, all the animal pens along here. Um, we didn't want to touch that wall because that wall uh, is, is in a pretty ropey state. Um, there's a brilliant engineer we work with who is very kind of practical and, and not worried about the kind of uh, over-engineering things. So, so he was saying, well, how much tolerance can we, can we accommodate? We don't want to fill the ground with concrete, especially if it's a, if it's a temporary site. So we've got a very shallow kind of raft foundation here. Uh, and then by spreading the load um, across three lines of structure, it really helps. A uh, little kind of uh, composting toilet in there. Um, and then the studio at the other end of the site. So the, the influences on the studio were a range. We've got, we've got the kind of agricultural, agricultural sheds, you know, the kind of the leanest um, structures um, imaginable. We loved the drawing studios at the RA um, and, and just the simplicity of the North Light. Um, and 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 the kind of simple form, and then um, and then the concept of of the kind of enclosed walled garden. So so these were the kind of things feeding into our end of the site. So so this is the plan of the studio, and it's just it's really lean and rational and stripped back because because we were paying for it. So that's 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 probably the main reason. But it's also down to the fact that it could be constructed off site. Um, Alex Thomas, who was the first person we employed, he had, he had left us because he was frustrated about not knowing enough about building. So he had gone off to become a timber framer. And then we gave him his first proper job as an independent timber framer, which was to build our studio. So uh, it's a Douglas fir frame. It's really simple. And then we have this wonderful garden that was uh, part funded um, by the Garden Bridge. So the Garden Bridge project, which we would absolutely not not kind of you know affiliated with in any way but they had a kind of community element that they wanted to um, uh, put some money back into the community so um, so so that was all planted up by by the students and they they used that space so this is the the framing diagram it's all really really simple um, it's uh, there's Alex and Jan so the guys who who constructed it um, this is the Douglas fir frame being, being built down in uh, Devon. And we managed to get 7.5 meter spans and it was all, um, it was all flash kiln to stop, to stop any kind of uh, moisture growth on, on the timber. Um, but it w we, we couldn't kiln dry it. Um, the 7.5 meters is, is quite large for, for, for single, um, for solid pieces of timber, especially in Douglas fir. And, We've since specified it on a number of projects where the same supplier has refused so, so, and say, we don't do that. And so we kind of sat there underneath the roof going, we know you do. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and so the, the, the purlins are kind of uh, housed within it. And you can see these, um, these kind of paired beams are just, uh, they're bolted through on one side and on the other side, they're very simple. Um, so this is the frame going up, and that's the context with St. Thomas's in the background. Um, uh, and I, I just thought it was a really beautiful kind of juxtaposition of this strange urban context. So this is when the, the frame was going up. Um, we, we, con we, uh, we kind of acted as main contractor, so we subbed out all the, the different bits, and that, that no doubt kind of made it far more economic, um, but took more time. Um, and then there's a few shots of, of the studio as it is. So, so these are these are T columns. They were um, they were laser cut and welded up, 
and they sit within the paired beam, and then we can have, uh, we've got a, a W20 kind of steel um, glazing system along, along the front. Um, the idea is we can move this in the future, and if we do, I think there's a whole load of lessons learned that we will kind of, we will apply to the next, the next iteration. Um, it's, uh, it, things like the ventilation works really well. We've got a little kind of a hatch which runs along here, and they can, they can open and close. It's got a very kind of mute presence to the street, um, but that's, that's partly down to kind of security, but it's also it's partly about this kind of sequence of spaces and, and revealing it as you come round. And then once you're into the garden, and you've got this incredible garden and the studio, and the, the idea of that walled garden kind of wrapping right the way through the studio and that datum kind of continuing round. Um, and, and the views back out are lovely, and it's, you're constantly, you know, you're constantly aware of the seasons and the changing uh, light. And then here we've got a little kind of open, open gutter drain, and there's no, there's no, um, we don't, we don't have any gutters on the roof. So when it rains, you get to enjoy the kind of the splashing, and it fills up, and it's, it's really, it's really beautiful. Um, this is, this is the students planting it up. Um, and then the last project we did was a little kind of a little garden room um, on the site. The barn was the next thing. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll whip through this one because there's some projects I would like to I'd like to talk to you about in more detail. So, but it, again, so it's constantly trying to kind of combine identity with uh, a low kind of a low environmental impact and what the kind of social drivers are. So we had this costed as a portal frame, but then it turned out that we were going to be filling each of the footings with two cubic meters of concrete. And it just felt, it felt insane that we weren't going to get any other, other benefits. So we moved to a raft foundation, and we, we split the structure, and we kind of treated it more, a bit more like the kind of the plan of a, of a church with a kind of nave and aisles. Um, and we, and this, is, this top diagram is the one which we took, which was this kind of big big bow, bow truss or diamond <coughs> truss, um, and we wanted that identity to come right the way through the project and run through into, into the street. Um, so this is also built by, um, <coughs> built by Alex and Jan, um, and this is, the, this is the frame going up. It's always kind of my favorite point in projects, really, um, when they're at their kind of skeletal best. And so you can see how that follows through to the cladding and gives it this identity onto the street. Um, and, and then we have, we have a kind of a view right the way through the site, all the way to, down to the studio. Um, and every, so each time, you know, there's something's evolving and the, and the technology that we're using might be, might be just, just tweaked. So here we've got these ply gussets, so they were all CNC cut. Um, Again, this is Douglas fir, but it's, it's rough sawn, um, it's bolt connections, we've got a slight fall on the slab, and then we've got this insulated classroom at the back. But it's an incredibly kind of demountable um, project, um, and I'm kind of quite excited about where it's going to go next. So I'm going to talk to you now just about, um, about a project that we finished this year, and uh, We've been working on it since 2014. So when I showed you all those kind of small-scale art projects, they all led into um, winning this commission, which was you know, our, our most significant commission by a long way, because A, it was our first public building. B, it was a kind of gallery. Uh, C, it was a fantastic client who's well-connected. And you, know, you can kind of go on. The benefits of, of working on a scheme like this are tremendous. So it's a project that we actually probably, well, I know we'd, we we spent far more fee than we than we got, but we always said we know what the impact of doing this properly will be. So, um, like we're on, I think we're on five percent fee on this, which is less than we're on on some of the school projects. So it's really low, and given that pretty much everything is bespoke, it's quite it's quite a challenge. But but it's been anyway. I'll 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 talk I'll talk you through I'll talk you through the context. So. So this is the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which is about seven miles south of Wakefield. Um, it's just off the M1, so if you find yourself driving north, it's, it's a truly magical place to visit. Um, and they have this incredible landscape that's been, uh, that's been kind of reunified over the last 40 years. The Sculpture Park's just had its 40th um, birthday, um, 
And the Sculpture Park grew out of uh, an art college that was in Bretton Hall, which is the old historic um, kind of uh, mansion house in the middle of, of the park. Um, and they started having, uh, there's a guy called Peter Murray, and he started putting, landscape, putting sculptures in the landscape and got the council to kind of back them slightly. Uh, and lots of, lots, of different, uh, lots of different collections they managed to acquire, and they started a really kind of amazing building program with, uh, with the first project, which was um, so a Field and Clegg Bradley project um, for the main visitor center, and then the underground gallery, which is absolutely, you know, they're, they're really stunning. And then they've also commissioned pieces. They've got one by Adam Kahn. They've got something by Tony Fretton on the other side of, of the valley. And they're really kind of inspired client. But we came to this project um, knowing the site a little bit, but not, not a huge amount. Um, and we, um, it, was, it was a design competition. So, so we started looking at their existing context, um, both of the landscape, um, the buildings, and, and the sculpture within it. Um, the location of the project is here on, on this boundary, uh, and that's the, that's the M1. So we're kind of, the, the noise was really significant. And we really wanted to draw people over from the main visitor center over to this site and create all these new routes around the, around the site. So loads of our projects have, have a kind of a master planning element um, and trying to understand the people flows or trying to kind of change the way that these kind of high volume sites operate. And here, of course, we're, we're kind of, we're opening up this whole part of the park or putting a destination over here for people to walk across the park. So from their point of view, suddenly they've got, they've got you know, well, hundreds of acres of, of land that they can start to use more effectively than, than they were. Um, so, as I say, we, we were looking at existing contexts, like this is the deer shelter, um, James Terrell's um, sculpture. This, then they, they have a huge number of kind of Henry Moore sculptures within the, within the grounds, Barbara Hepworth, um, Andy Goldsworthy using kind of existing contexts. Um, and, and, and so we, we wanted to kind of, we wanted to take a position about building in, the, in, in, a, in this landscape that was somehow kind of not competing with the sculpture, not competing with the land, but something very modest and kind of sensitive. So this is the site before, before we started. Um, it looks quite pleasant, but most of the time, you know, you could hear the noise of the motorway. Uh, the car park was, um, had a kind of a public toilet that had a reputation for all sorts of uh, things I can't talk about. Um, it, uh, it, it was not a very savory place. Um, so, so, so we said, okay, well, we want to create a threshold. This is a building that has to work from both directions. So we're bringing people off the, off the M1 into, into an existing car park and into the building. So we wanted to push the building right the way to the boundary and make it a boundary building that you kind of passed through and then started to encounter, encounter these views. So these are some of the sketches from, from the competition stage. Uh, and you can see we were kind of really wrestling with, with, with the land and the topography and the form and, and just, just what our kind of uh, intervention and imposition in this landscape was going to be. Um, this one here, the, the kind of crescent facade option was, was pretty much kind of what we ended up uh, building. So it was, it, was, it was quite a good way to tease out lots of things in a short space of time. Um, there were a number of land artists like Michael Heiser that we were, that we were looking at and referencing. Um, and this idea of this kind of monolithic gateway um, and, and telling a geological story through the building um, felt really kind of potent. So we wanted to, we wanted to kind of explore those ideas. Um, and Robert Morris with, with um, this observatory project that was all about sun paths and kind of clear axes through the land. So we were trying to find, you know, what is the, what is the kind of the, the key diagram or the key kind of spatial sequence of getting people into this building. So, so that's the building in the landscape, and the, and the bank is kind of, you know, this, the hill is going up here. The, the car park was remodeled slightly, but really quite minimally. Um, there's just one entrance coming through the building, and then the, we've got that kind of subtle arc here, kind of, um, which uh, the arc we felt was really important, because it's, it's a bit like the building is kind of literally embracing the landscape with these, with these arms. Um, 
And it also takes it away from being something which is quite a severe building. And the noise, the noise of the M1 is really significant. So we've put all of our services and all of the back of house uh, along this edge, and that acts as, acts as a buffer zone and frees us up to then to look back out to the park. Um, the gallery itself is, is deeply embedded within the hill, and then we have, uh, I'll, I'll come on to it, but we have, we have quite an unusual environmental strategy. So the wall development was fundamental, and um, it, it was quite a wrestle because originally we conceived of this as this kind of geological slice or revealing this kind of geological slice into the landscape. Um, and, and, and for it just to very, be very slender and subtly emerge um, and, and draw from those land artists. Um, but there was a stage where it was, it was going to be constructed from rammed earth and, um, and that was, I think, I think we, we, we had worked quite hard to get the client to buy into that, but then we found that with the rammed earth, so all of the, all of the experts were coming from Australia, so that felt like, well, we were already um, we're having a massive carbon footprint, um, despite the actual materials being, um, being very low carbon. Um, it was, uh, we couldn't get any warranties, um, and for, for a project which is funded largely by the Arts Council, that's really <coughs> fundamental. Um, the contractor and the subcontractor seemed to be at war before the project even started. So, so we, we ended up saying, oh, and, it was, and, and to do it, it had to be stabilized rammed earth with at least 10% cement. So we kind of had a, you know, it's a bit like crap concrete, really. So it wasn't, it wasn't really quite rammed earth anyway. And the level of control was, it was quite minimal. So, so anyway, the walls developed into, into uh, in situ concrete walls, but we managed to reduce the carbon content through GGBS and through having a weaker mix because they weren't having to work so hard. And, and, then, and then everything else in the building has tried to, we've tried to source as locally as possible. So, so this, is, um, this is a map of, a geological map of Yorkshire and the <coughs> blue dots represent the different sources of aggregate. And, and we, wanted, we wanted to have, uh, we wanted to have uh, limestone, sandstone, and granite, which can all be found in the site if you take a slice, really deep sl borehole through the through the site. But we so we were doing these tests, and these test panels were kind of you know just a hell of a long way from where we wanted to be. Um, and the client, who's a, a really the key client, was an inspiring. She's an inspiring woman called uh, Claire Lilly, and she she's incredibly particular, and you know she doesn't beat about the bush. So. When she saw something like this, she basically kind of walked away. She was she was so disappointed. And from I mean, we were too. But it is you know having a good tough client is is fantastic because it meant that we could really drive the contractor. We could drive we could drive ourselves, um, and we could start to evolve a specification that was beginning to resemble something that we wanted. So this upper portion of the panel was where we we started to kind of get closer, um, and then within that, so we've got different size of aggregate. We tried using a retardant on the formwork of the, of the shuttering and then jet washing it after. The previous one was using, um, was shot blasted, but it came out like terrazzo. So there's kind of, you know, we're trying all sorts of different things. The length of time between, between the pores of concrete, um, this is all vibrated so that it doesn't have air pockets in it and things. It's, uh, it was, it was quite, um, it was quite, quite interesting and, you know, we'd, we'd, we're kind of, we were working it out with, with these subcontractors. Um, and we ended up producing quite a detailed specification on that um, for every panel of the building. And that kind of, that ran right the way around the building. And then it was all batch, batch mixed on site in one meter cubes, uh, one meter cube at a time, uh, and then poured into the formwork. Um, we tried it without uh, tie bars between it or without, uh, without ties between the formwork on either side, but the pressure meant that we actually ended up with some kind of pillowing. Um, this is, I, I love these moments like where you get the kind of the runnels in it where the, where the, jet, where the jet washing had happened. And, it, and again, it kind of feels very geological and, um, and the tones are very, well, the tones are really critical. Um, and here you can see that the tones of these walls are in relation to the kind of millstone grit and the boulders that came out of the site, they're, they're really, they're, they're quite closely um, kind of aligned. Um, 
We've got an unfired clay brick labyrinth in the scheme. So this is 10,000 unfired clay bricks, and they're laid in a labyrinth, and we blow the air through them to regulate the, the humidity in the gallery. So galleries have very specific um, controls, so temperature <coughs> and humidity. Um, and actually, YSP were more relaxed about the, the temperature variation, but the humidity was really fundamental, um, especially when you're in a kind of parkland setting, and you might have... 100 people walking across the park in pouring rain and then they come into the gallery and they're all kind of dripping and you know we quite quickly need to be able to modify that environment so so we have a kind of a diverter in 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 this which means that if it's 50% relative humidity outside we can we can use the we can we can basically ventilate directly into the gallery if it's but if it's higher or lower, we'll use the labyrinth to moderate, um, moderate the humidity. And then we bring the, the fresh, cool air in here at high level. It drops down uh, behind a screen and comes out, uh, comes out at low level. And then these, these holes at the top extract the, uh, extract the kind of foul air. So I'll just quickly show how kind of the whole, kind of the whole thing came together. But, um, but the tones were really fundamental. Um, this, this arc was a really important element. We've got a Douglas fir um, frame inside uh, and, a, and a RICO system outside. So, uh, so this is effectively just a visual timber, timber screen here, which can be replaced at, at any point. Um, uh, this is probably the most controversial element of the scheme. It's a GRP screen that is designed so that we can we can, we can exhibit artwork. There's one specific artwork that has been designed to go against it. But I think during various conversations and judging and things, that came in for the most, for the most criticism. Um, lots of different kind of qualities of light and natural materials. We've got a, um, a, a, an eco-mortar kind of lime-based um, plaster. Um, with a natural, with its natural tone, uh, supplied by Timara all the way around in, internally, um, we've used a, a lye, which is um, it's uh, it's it's got a certain pH, which means that it stops the kind of acidic growth, or it's, I mean, stops any kind of organic growth on the, on the timber, but it also uh, it really um, reduces the, the the UV impact. And then we've got this, this very kind of cool gallery space with the concept of that stretched canvas all the way around. And that serves, that serves to, to deal with all our ventilation um, and the very kind of subtle bull nose of the, of the concrete. Um, so it's, a, it's quite a kind of simple, modest building. It costs 2.8 million, um, uh, but it's completely transformed this part of the site. and and. It's incredibly calm when you're in there. You know, it's really, you come from the bustle of the motorway and you step into the building and everything becomes kind of calm and reflective. And, and people, have, they've been just so respectful of the building. It's really interesting. I was terrified that it would, it would start to get bashed about instantly, especially things like these columns. But um, it's kind of the opposite environment, say, designing um, for schools. So it's really, it's really lovely. <laughs> um, and and yeah, just a very simple building. But it's uh, it for us, it kind of represented kind of growing up as a practice and and delivering yeah delivering our first public building. Um, this is a project that it's not yet finished. It finishes in the spring. But um, apart from the what Yorkshire Sculpture Park, this is this is my this is my other kind of favourite project that's been going on for a number of years. This is Carlisle Cathedral Precinct. Um, Carlisle, I don't know how many of you have been there or know it, but it's on the border to Scotland. Um, Hadrian's Wall runs through it, and it's, um, uh, it was described in The Guardian as, um, as like Sean Bean with its rugged good looks, and I thought that was a lovely kind of description. But it is a, it's a bloody tough place in some respects. Um, but the, and the cathedral is a really incredibly special building, inevitably. Um, it's right at the heart of... of of the town, um, but it's been kind of unloved for a long time. And this building in particular, which is the old priory, um, had a, a little porch by quite a well, very well-known architect called G. E. Street that was built at the end of his life. And it was a, it was a very compromised um, structure because 
the, the building is, is half a level up and half a level down. And in the undercroft, there was, uh, there was this really kind of rather sad cafe. Um, and, uh, and, you know, not really kind of commercially viable. Um, and the main freightry hall was not really used. And it sits between, this is the castle and this is the station. So it sits on this kind of historic axis. And everyone kind of passes through this precinct, but, but the main freightry hall here was completely unused. And so, so what they needed was, um, was a combination of new toilets, a proper threshold, and making the building accessible to everyone. Um, so when we started, we, we, we did this diagram for them where we said, you've kind of made a traffic island of, of this building, uh, and the amount of kind of, uh, you know, of tarmac everywhere is, is just taking away from any sense of historic um, setting. Whereas back in the 15th century, there was, there was a cloister at the heart of it um, and the priory, and this was a reflective space, and it wasn't just a thoroughfare on the way from the car park to the shopping area. Um, so, so that was quite a kind of a clear kind of uh, diagram to, to try and work with. And, and so our early concepts were saying, well, we need a link building to deal with this, uh, to deal with the, the, the access. And then we're going to kind of reform something that references the cloister. Um, at this stage, we, we were coming in for, a, we, we came in for a lot of flack. We did some visuals that were, they, they were probably just too kind of um, architectural, I think. <laughs> and there was a guy who was the ex-head of planning who wrote to the local paper and he, he basically said, this project will never happen over my dead body. And we, we got him in to talk to him. And it turned out it's because there was a bench which was here. And he said, I actually don't have a problem with the building. <laughs> he said, but I love that bench. And that's my favorite view. And I don't want a building. <laughs> so, so that was interesting. <laughs> so, but one of the things we knew we had to do was soften it. And so we went from having a very kind of simple uh, kind of modernist pavilion to bringing in something that was this hybrid with, with, this, with the kind of the Gothic dropped arches. Um, and they were drawn from the, the geometry and the, and, um, the, the layout of, of this Gothic dropped arch in the west end of the building. So we were kind of, you know, we did quite a lot of analysis of, of the site and understanding, understanding what it was that, that made it very particular to Carlisle. Um, this is, a, this is a, the footprint of it. So this is, this is a, a glazed link, and then this is all, all masonry, um, and this will have a cafe and some interpretation, and then you go up at half level and down a half level. So you can see there. And, um, uh, and, and the, the, kind of the qualities that we wanted to, kind of, we wanted to bring out were the refinement of the, um, uh, of the uh, perpendicular Gothic, this very fine tracery. Um, so having really you know, slender leading edges. And then we have this, this latticed roof, which um, references various structures around, around, the, uh, around the precinct. And that's all in bronze. Um, I'll quickly flick through these because the construction of this building is just it's just been so interesting there's the movement is really critical there's a um, there's a there's an underground river which we didn't know about uh, which runs under here <laughs> uh, it's not huge it's a culvert really but there's quite a lot of water running underneath there it's also where the arches in the basement are going into reverse and so you can imagine what happens when a, an arch goes into reverse so the whole of this end of the building was at risk of collapsing um, this is just the temporary works for opening that, for making this opening. Um, and when Street had, uh, had, had put his porch on, he had, taken, he had taken that doorway and he'd reversed it and dropped it down. So there was like this half level up, half level down just for the doorway. The doorway was kind of, everything was back to front. So we said, well, let's flip it round. Let's, let's return it to where it should be. Let's get level access. And, but we, to do that, we had to, we had to create these new openings in the, in the project. Um, and we've got loads of monitors. They get monitored every day for millimeter movements. And there was one stage where we were saying, it looks like the building's kind of collapsing. <laughs> you know, it's moved by a certain number of millimeters over the last kind of three weeks. But what we're finding is that actually the building is moving, but it's, it, what happens is that these arches are sometimes opening up and then they close again. And the, and the whole, you know, the, the amount of groundwater affects it, the temperatures, there's so many factors and it's so complicated. And we've, we've had four different engineers on it. They're all working in collaboration, but 
it's a real kind of, and, and then politically, we're kind of trying to hold everyone together and keep everyone, kind of keep the faith on this one. So um, this is reversing that archway. Um, and it's just, it's just wonderful working on an old building like this because you feel like, you know, you're just part of this story. You know, this will be adapted again in the future. Hopefully they won't reverse the doorway again, but it's... Uh, but it's, it's, really, it's really incredible. It, it just doesn't feel like any other project we've ever worked on. So, um, you know, brilliant local masons who, who are making up all of these kind of all, all of all of the false work for the arches. This is the main space. So this was it previously, and this is as we're beginning to restore it. So there was a 17th century library that we're, we've, we're restoring, but returning back to making this into one space. We've removed this screen. Um, we've put new lighting in, new heating. It's just kind of pairing it all back into, into a really kind of celebratory hall. And then the, the stonework is, is just truly exquisite. So it's all CNC'd. So we have this double curvature taking up the arch and going into, going into this leading fine, um, fine edge. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's completely fascinating. I will quickly whip through these. So th this is some of the stonework going in. Um, and then this is the bronze structure. And the bronze structure is, um, is causing major, major headaches because they saved 50 grand by going to a, a non-bronze specialist. But um, it's already caused two months delay. And you can imagine, you know, just it's, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. I think it will still be beautiful, but it won't kind of... It'll just be a different thing. It'll be a bit more raw. Um, and then these are just some visuals of how, how it's going to be at the, end of, at the end of it. So in the spring, this will be completed. Um, it'll be opening, opening in the spring, summer. It's really close to the railway station if ever you, you're, you're passing nearby. Um, it's, and it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be quite significant because there hasn't been a building here for 500 years. Cathedral precincts often don't don't have much change, uh, or certainly not in the heart of them. Um, so, uh, as, yeah, I absolutely love that project.